but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Before I open up uh, the message for today, I just have a couple more announcements if you would allow me to. Um, we really need help with the Bounce House Bash. Um, and so uh, last time we had it, we're looking to do it once a month. Last time we had it, we had um, mostly uh, pastoral staff heading it up, and we need about 10 people uh, to just kind of, man, give kids high fives as they come in. I think we had close to 400 kids last time in the gym and in the playground. And so if you're willing to help with that, uh, I'm just one, maybe one step forward, one step more. Uh, in, your, in front of you, there's a, a, a place that just sounds like I want to get involved or serve. And it'll serve team as a black card. Uh, if you already turned in your connection card, which I know you faithfully did, um, go ahead and take that card out and maybe just t- write in there, yeah, I'd be willing to serve in a bounce house bash or something. And um, same thing with FPU. Uh, we have a couple spots left. And so uh, consider that. Finally, uh, last week, I think we had 31 junior kid zone for the second service. So that's really cool, 31 kids. Um, so we met this week, changed things up a little bit. If you brought kids today, you already found out what happened, and maybe if you could help spread the word. Uh, but what we're going to start doing is uh, everyone still has to do check-in, uh, whether you just have junior kid zone age or kid zone or nursery, so everyone goes to check-in. Uh, if you have younger children, you'll still drop them off along that hallway. And then if you go to preschool junior, you'll actually come around, you'll drop off the kids in the playground, in the play zone. So that's all the new drop-off will be. But when you pick them up, you'll pick them up in the classrooms. And so drop off after you get checked in in the play area, the play zone. But when you pick them up, pick them up uh, in the regular classroom. And so far, we'll have two classes. We'll be adding a third class. So that's super encouraging. It's a good problem to have. Amen. And so thank you for bringing your kids and to let them become a part of uh, just gathering together. So we've been going through the book of Proverbs. And I, I, because you guys are absolutely faithful and amazing, I know you've been reading a chapter every day. And I want to encourage you to keep, to keep doing that. Um, I will remind you throughout the year uh, for 2023, hey, are you reading your chapter a day? Um, I'm going to go back to January the 1st and just rewind a little bit. What, what did we go over as it looked into Proverbs? Um, Proverbs was written by, mostly by Solomon, who is known as the wealthiest and the wisest person to ever live. Uh, but why was it written? And here's what Proverbs chapter 1, verses 2 through 6 say, uh, the good news uh, translation or uh, paraphrase. Here are Proverbs that will help you recognize wisdom and good advice. And understanding sayings with deep meaning. They can teach you how to live intelligently and how to be honest and just and fair. They can make an inexperienced person clever and teach young people how to be resourceful. These proverbs can add to knowledge of the wise and give guidance to the educated so that you can understand the hidden meanings of proverbs and the problems that wise raise. Proverbs is available to help us work through like disobedience, how to fight worry, uh, consequences of an unguarded heart, the problems with uncontrolled tongues, uh, discontentment, lustful temptations, procrastination, laziness, marriage, finances, raising children, how to be a godly son or a godly daughter, revenge, addiction, envy, motherhood, and of course, Proverbs reminds us several times that the most important thing in finding knowledge is to what? Fear the Lord. The beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge is fearing the Lord in the sense of saying in holy honor and respect and recognizing who God is. That's the beginning of wisdom. Today, I want to talk about Proverbs as it relates to families. So what does Proverbs say to families, and specifically, to, to, I'm going to break it around two areas. The first area specifically is to children. And so let me just help you real quick. Um, everyone here that hears my voice is a child. That's somebody. Like you all had a parent. And so the part with children pertains to all of us. 
It might change a little bit as we age or whatever, but if your parents are alive, there's still a, a, a part that we have to be to be a godly child, whatever that might look like. We're going to talk about that. The second, we're going to talk, the second thing we'll talk about is wisdom to parents. And in that, I would still include anyone that has the role in guiding and leading our young people, especially grandparents. If you have a role in leading and guiding young people, listen up. So here we go. Um, Reference an important media, if you will. Uh, Right Now Media is something that we have available for all of you. You can find it at uh, newlife906.com under uh, the Life Group tab. It's a free resource. It has thousands of resources. You also can go to the Church Center app and find it. But there is something I've been listening to over the last couple of weeks, and I didn't touch on uh, really any of it in this sermon, but uh, Dr. Tony Evans does a series called Raising Kingdom Kids, and it is very good. And it's in Right Now Media. If you go to Pastor Jason's Corner, I put it as the first resource But I strongly encourage you, if you're not using Right Now Media, uh, we're paying nearly, last year we were paying nearly $200 a month just for you to have resources to use it. So please, please use it. Young people, I know you're taking notes because you're stinking amazing. So here we go. (laughs) Wisdom to young people, here it is. Whenever possible, whenever possible, Bring joy to your parents. And let me just say this. Again, it doesn't just apply to the teenager or the preteen. I believe biblically it applies to all of us that have a parent. Part of our responsibility is to do the best we can to bring joy. But it's not as hard as we think it is. Because it's not joy from coming from like performance. The Bible isn't saying, hey, if you perform up to stuff, if you get straight A's, if everything's together, then you'll bring joy. That's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say perfection. If you just live your life in a perfect way and then your parents will be happy and you can all sing kumbaya, it's not saying that. It's not even saying, young person, you'll appreciate this, It's not even saying that you have to obey everything your parents say to you. However, if you're under the age of 18 and living at home, you probably should. (laughs) If you're older, it's saying not necessarily. But Proverbs does a great job of summing up, how do I bring joy to my parents? Like, what does that look like? Proverbs 10.1 says this. Wise children bring joy to their father, but foolish children bring grief to their mother. Where does wisdom come from again? A healthy fear of the Lord. So check this out. If wisdom starts with a healthy fear of the Lord, the answer to bring in joy to your parents is that each of us live with a healthy fear of God. That's where joy starts. So we live, young person, listen to me. You live your life, old person, listen to me. You live your life with the idea is how does God want me to live in this situation? If you do that, your parents will be joyful even if they're an atheist because you are living the right life. They may not like you where you go to church, but they'll like the life you're living. Proverbs 23, 24 says this, the father of a righteous child has great joy. A man who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. Righteousness, not perfection, not blind obedience, not getting straight A's, but righteousness, right standing before God Honoring him will bring joy to your parents. And that's something God calls us to do. As a matter of fact, the fifth commandment says this, what? Honor your father and your mother. It's the only commandment that I'm aware of that actually gives you a promise. And it's repeated in Ephesians chapter 6, 2, 3, 3. And it says this, honor your father and mother, 
which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. You want a key for life going well with you? Honor your parents. Honor your father and your mother. Does that mean you agree with everything they say? No. Does that mean you like everything they do? No. It simply means that you have a reverence and a respect for the role that God has given to them in your life. And here's the hard part. Let's just, let's just be honest together, parents. Has anyone parented perfectly? Just raise a hand real high. I just want to see you, your hand. Anybody? Anybody like, I wrote the book in Parenting 101. I, I sometimes, I'm 50, and I'm like, God, what were you thinking? Giving me a child when I was like 22. Anybody else relate? Like, I'm still like at 50. I'm going, okay, I'm at 50, and I think maybe I'm ready, but now I know too much that I don't want anymore. I am, I am so ready for grandparent mode. I am ready to spoil them and send them home. Right? Grandparents, amen? Just feed them whatever they want and play. I didn't know any better. And then just let them go home. Like, I'm ready for that. But the problem is, is like, like no one's perfect. No one parents, right? So sometimes it can be hard to honor a parent that did not do it the right way. But I want to suggest to you that we can still say, you know what? I respect the role that God gave to them to me, even if I disagree with what they did or how they did it. I look back over my life and I'm like, oh my gosh, I made a lot of mistakes. Yesterday, I made mistakes. Thank you for not amening that to the kids that are here. Um, I get offended, I get hurt, I get frustrated, which leads to anger, which you go, you know how that goes. As a parent, I mean, don't we want to do the right thing? Like every parent I know says, you know what, I want to do it. One of the reasons we built the community center is I never met a parent that said, you know what, I just hope to destroy my kids' lives. It's my goal in life. No one says that. And so I thought, what if we built something to create community for parents to hang out together and learn from each other? And, and like, what, and what if? And here we are. But to honor means to respect the role that they have. Even when you disagree. Let me just say this, um, on the same vein, respect is looked at different ways um, at different age levels, and even, I think, honoring looks a little different. So when when you're under the age of 18 and you're still living at home, uh, I want to suggest to you that if your parents tell you to do something, you should do it. That's just wise. That's just wisdom. But there comes a time, teenager, listen to me, this is important. There comes a time as a teenager when you're supposed to pull away a little bit. I tell all my children this, all my kids, when they're like really cool and awesome, and then they become teenagers and like, you know, not so. Anyway, um, I'm like, there's going to come a time when we're going to kind of clash a little bit. We're going to kind of just, you know, it's just going to be tough. Just know that I love you and you love me even though you forget that you do, but just remember that you do. And, um, but that's healthy because this is why. There's an independent that's supposed to start taking place at teenage years that a teenager is supposed to start thinking for themselves, start working things for themselves. A parent is still saying, hey, I'm putting boundaries around you, but there should be some rubbing and some conflict that takes place. This is important. Why Why should it be rubbing and conflict? Because there needs to be a place when a teenager starts to be independent and starts to get ready to lead their own life. One of the worst things that you can do as a parent is to not allow your teenager the privilege of sometimes disagreeing with you. Like, they can disagree with you as long as they do it in a respectful way, right? One of the worst things you can do is to keep trying to overshadow your teenager because what will happen is you'll end up being a parent in ways that you don't want a parent until, like, right, in their 20s and in their 30s and they're like somebody, right? Right? Forgive me. Um, I kind of want my kids out of the house at some point. 
Is that fair? Like, I love, I love my kids. I, 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 with everything in me, I just want them out of my home. <laughs> and, and I'm going to do everything in my power to prepare them to get out of my home and still be together with grace and love and kindness. Are you with somebody? Amen. So allow your teenager to be a teenager. And let me just speak to teenagers again. So I'm talking to you. When you disagree with your parents, it's okay. But do it in a way that's respectful and honorable. And maybe in the emotion, you can't do that very well. And so sometimes maybe you have to just hang out and chill. And, but maybe you can sit, come back and say, hey, listen, can I just talk to you for a moment? And, and, and just, you know, I disagree with this. This is why. And maybe there'll be a compromise. I've compromised once or twice in my whole life, right? <laughs> maybe there'll be a compromise. Maybe there'll be something working together. If you can't have a conversation because of whatever reason, maybe try it in a letter format, just simply saying, hey, you know, I'm getting older. I, this is what I wish could happen. And, and just, but you can do that in an honorable way. True? So young person, like, just honor Honor. When the baton gets passed, and in our life, this is where we kind of pass the baton. Uh, we slowly pass it, slowly, slowly. But when they graduate from high school, we pretty much are like, there you go. And so for us, we really have two basic rules in our home when they graduate from high school, if they're still there. Um, it is, it's, hey, just tell us where you're going and when you're going to come back because we love you and we worry about you. That's, our, that's one. And then the other one is this. Like, this is still my house, and I just ask that you respect the principles that we have in, in my house, in our home. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty good. So, but as a parent, as a teenager, just know when that baton gets passed and let it get passed. I'm going to go back to parents again. Be careful in trying to parent past the age that you're supposed to parent. Parents are always going to parent, right? Mom, I love you. You're watching today, I know, and you're amazing. But sometimes parents just got to kind of let go and let, let us grow and, like, we make our mistakes and we learn from them. If you keep bailing out your kids every time they make a mistake, they're not going to grow and learn. And young person, listen, you can be 40 and still be young. If you have a problem that you made, don't always come running back to mom and dad to help you financially because you made a mistake. Like, learn from it, somebody. Like, it's so quiet. It's, none of this is in the first service. It's all free for second service people. Um, but, like, if you, if, you, if you made a mistake, like, learn and grow and deal with the consequences of that mistake and, like, embrace that as part of growing up. And, oh, I'm going to go all out. Um, Sometimes that means even refusing help from your parents that want to help you, which is so hard. Hey, can I give you $5,000 to help you? Um, no, right? So I'll move right along. Um, number two, young person, young person, always be willing to learn. And this is the last one for you. Then you can go back to whatever you're doing. Always be willing to learn. Here, here's what Proverbs 15, 32 says. If you reject discipline, you're only harming yourself. But if you will listen to correction, you will grow in understanding. New Living Translation. Proverbs 26, 13 says, do you see people who are wise in their own eyes? In other words, they think they have it together. There is more hope for them, more hope rather for a fool than for them. Be willing to learn, young people. Like, here's the deal. I'm just going to be, like, when I was 15, I was amazed at how much my parents didn't know. Just like, gosh, are you kidding me? Like, they didn't know anything. Any 15-year-olds agree with me, don't raise a hand. But I was amazed by the time I was 26 how much they learned in, like, five years, 10 years. I'm like, wow, you guys got like a whole doctorate in parenting in 10 years. What happened? <laughs> young person, sarcasm. Young person, like, like be willing to learn. Be willing to say, you know what? I don't have it all together. You might have a little bit more experience than me. You, you've been on this path. Like, maybe I will heed. 
maybe not my parents' advice, but maybe somebody else that's an adult. Like, like be willing to listen and to learn. Honestly, at any age that you are, whether you are 10 or 15 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80, until you die, there's still stuff to learn. So have a willing heart to learn. Be willing to learn. One of the worst examples of what happens, and this is an example of more hope for a fool than someone that's willing to learn, is found in Romans chapter 1. And Paul is basically rebuking the, 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 the culture, the Roman culture. And let me just read part of this uh, chapter to you. Chapter 1, verse 22. Although they claim to be wise, they claim to know that everything together, they thought they knew everything, they actually became fools. They exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Commentary, in essence, they took away who God really is and started worshiping the things that were made that became their idols, the most important thing to them. Therefore, because they gave up who God is and his majesty and started worshiping things made by hands, made by people, the things that he made, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. It is a exclamation mark to you and to me to keep learning and keep understanding. Listen, God has set up guidelines and rules and, 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 and instruction manual for our life. And when we think we know better, we're in trouble every time. This is the scary part for me. This is always so hard. God gave them over. You know what that means? That means that their heart changed and they didn't know it. The problem with deception is Deceptive, you don't know you're being deceived. By definition, they were being deceived but thought that they were speaking truth because they stopped being willing to learn. To parents, grandparents, number one, teachers, you have more influence than you think. You have more influence than you think. I have been told so many times that, you know, uh, kids don't really listen to their parents. It's whatever their peer group is and social media and, and whatever is around them. And there's probably some truth to that. But let me just back up. How many of you, when you were young, said stuff like in your mind, I will never do what my parents did? Like there were words that you promised yourself, I will never say it. You promised. You know what? When my kids start crying, I'm never going to say, hey, stop crying or I'm going to give you something to cry about. <laughs> How many of you have said it? Come on. The rest of you, you have your time. It's coming. <laughs> or you were like, you know what? When my kids, when I become a parent, I'm going to do it the right way. When my kids ask me why I have to do something, I'm going to try to share with them why they have to do it. And so at two years old, hey, listen, you know what? The implications of the decisions that you're making are causing ramifications bigger than you understand at your level. And if you just follow my advice, your life will go well this year, next year, and the following year, and you'll help your mental state. And therefore, just listen to the advice that I give to you. Let me know how that goes. So... Like most of you, you tried that. I tried that. And it lasted a couple times. And all of a sudden, I remember the day when I found myself saying, and, the, and like my child was like, why? Why do I have to do it? Because I said so. <laughs> and I embraced it with all that's within me. I just said so. Oh, my gosh. My parents watch, and so I have to be very careful what I say. So I'm like, um, there's some things that we learned at home, not my home, your home, 
that you're like, I will never do. Like one of the things that my friend said he would never do that he learned at his home was, um, I will never yell at my kids. I'll never yell at my kids. Yeah, that lasted probably week two. <laughs> I, human nature, right? Here, this, look, think about your life for a moment. If you're an adult, think about your life for a moment. Your parents had way more influence on you than you ever thought that they would. So give yourself some credit. You have way more influence than you think you do. If you look at studies, studies like it's so interesting. They say that if your parents were controlling, nervous, reactive, introverted, most of us would carry on the similar type of things. Controlling, nervous, reactive, introverted. Most of us follow the same pattern. You have way more control, way more influence than you think you do. So what does that mean? What do you do with that? Proverbs picks it up perfectly in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. It's a principle. It's not every occasion, every time. It's a biblical principle that, generally speaking, as we chain our, train our children to go, that's how they will follow. So if you train your children in bad behavior and in yelling or in cursing or in not valuing generosity to things of God, you pretty much are training your kids in the same way. Now, is there exceptions? Absolutely. Can God change someone's heart? Thank God, yes. But the rule of thumb is as you have trained your child, eventually that's the path they will take. So if you train your child in righteousness and in faith and in generosity, valuing the things of God and in serving, they might rebel for a season, but there's a good chance they're coming back home. There's a really good chance. So take your responsibility seriously. And let me just hit just a couple. We call it this podium, whatever, like, a couple hot spots that I, I just want to share uh, just encouragement maybe. Live out honesty in your home and patience, humility and generosity. Live out the importance of church community. Something that Monica and I have done in 27 years of marriage, I did count this week, I, it's correct. If you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. If not, listen to the video or something. Uh, 27 years of marriage, one of the things that we have really felt important is that um, the church is not man's idea, it's God's idea. And that, I think it's Ephesians, it says it's through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is displayed, that God chose the church, capital C, to glorify his name in our world. So we have made it a priority that wherever we go, we'll be gathering together, worshiping with somebody. I think in 27 years, outside of COVID, in 27 years, I think we maybe have missed a Sunday gathering maybe six times tops. And I'm not doing it to say good boy because I'm actually a really bad dad in so many ways. But anyway, what I'm saying is in your family, stress the importance of gathering together and worshiping together, of making coming together a priority in your home. More and more, I think as COVID happened, you know, there's this idea that church is second, gathering together is second. I go on vacation, that's fine, but when you go on vacation, worship together. I love online, you that are online, but being online is not the same as being in person. It's just something altogether different. And for you that are checking things out and you're just, I get it, but if you're part of a church and like be engaged in church culture, stress the importance of getting together for things like youth group, children's ministries. As a youth pastor, it's always frustrating to me because I would prepare about where are the kids at, what's happening in their lives, and, you know, so-and-so wasn't there. And I'd be like, hey, where were you on Wednesday? I had homework. Get your homework done an hour beforehand. What are you talking about? You had homework. Mute just might be, just show up for youth group. Parents, like, make sure your kids do their homework when they get home. 
I'm, I don't know. I should just be careful. No, I shouldn't. Just like value, value, like they come together. Like that's, that's part of the responsibility of being a church is to help instill and encourage young people and encourage you. So make that a priority in, in your life. Um, let me go alongside that. It, listen, it is the parents' primary responsibility to raise their kids in Christ. Do you know that? Like, it's really your job to teach your kids how to be patient, how to pray, how to serve, how to apply the Bible in your life. It's really your job to make sure that your kids are serving God. And, and the church, our responsibility is to come alongside of you and to help you do what you're already doing at home. I, I hate it when people blame the church for their kids falling away from faith. Well, if they had a better youth group, forget that. That's just junk. That's... And just train your kids in the way they should go. Keep serving, keep speaking to their life. Some will fall away, some will make it, some will come back. Like, man, God is bigger than all of that. Just do your best, right, as parents to train them in the way they should go. In the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, there's a story of, um, they, they called them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the names that the Babylonians gave to them. And uh, Daniel was the Israelite name. God, God um, disciplines Judah, and out of that discipline, he, he causes Babylon to have victory in war, and the Babylonians take away the wisest people um, from Judah, and this is what they do. To get the Israelites to switch gods, to switch philosophy of living, to switch identity, they, in essence, remove the former identity that they have and cause them to question it. They try to change their names. They try to change their practices, right? You can't pray anymore. Here's your new name. They try to put them in schools to indoctrinate them in a new philosophy of living, all believing and hoping that they will forget the prior, the prior past that they lived and believing that if they can indoctrinate some of these strong kids, these strong kids will reach out to other kids in a destructive way. Are you following me? Parents, listen. I just want to say, be careful when it comes to sending your kids off to college. I'm all about further education. I'm just saying each child stands and you know where they are. Some young people can handle going to a secular university and their faith is strong and they have a firm foundation and they'll get there and they'll flourish and they'll love Jesus and they'll be a testimony to their school. But some kids don't have a firm foundation and as soon as they get to a secular college, their faith will be destroyed. So I'm just saying use wisdom. So I, I encourage, I always encourage young people, I'm like, you know what? Do whatever you want to, but would you prayerfully consider taking the first year after high school and going to a Bible college for just one year? North Central Trinity, Ashbury. Anybody heard of Ashbury before? There's a re little revival happening. I was just kind of making fun. Um, but find a Christian college. Give them a year. Um, by the way, if you go to the Assemblies of God College, there's a matching scholarship that New Life does. So if you fill out the application... Um, for $1,000, New Life matches. That means you have $2,000 right off the top that given to you. Just most people don't know that. And it was college days coming up that Pastor Whalen was taking kids too. So just consider, consider that, and, and, and I'll move on. Okay. Number two, parents, children need restraint and affirmation. They need both. Here's what Proverbs 19.18 says, discipline your children for in that there is hope. And listen to this. Do not be a willing party to their death. In other words, don't stand by watching your child self-destruct and think, well, I don't want to upset the house and they'll get mad at me. Yeah, let them get mad, but it's their life you're talking about. Don't be a willing party letting your child destroy their life when you just remain silent. They need affirmation, they need, you know, like, hey, you're amazing. They also need to hear, you're amazing, but this decision you're making is not a good one. They still need boundaries. They still need some things, guidelines set up. Proverbs 22, 15 says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Contrary to popular belief, uh, children born are not perfect. 
They're not little angels. As soon as your child comes out of the womb, you know that really quick. Um, they're screaming. Give me food. Give me water. Just, right? Romans 3.23. They're selfish. I mean, anyway. Um, <laughs> so our job as parents is to help guide them towards Jesus. If you need a savior. You need someone to help direct you, to guide you. And so that's part of a responsibility. The second thing I want to hit is this. Um, the Bible is also not saying, take a rod and beat your kids. So put that verse back up there again, would you? This is so often misquoted. By the way, the, Bible, the phrase, could you put that verse up there, please, one more time? Um, that last Proverbs one, yeah. A lot of people misquote this and they say, you know, the Bible says, spare the rod and spoil your kid, right? It's not really what it says. Um, it says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it away. Here's the deal. I'm not going to talk to you about whether you spank your child or not. That's between you and God and the Bible, and you read that through. But I am going to say this. The Bible does not say that we should hit our kid with a rod or even a stick. Here's what the rod is talking about. You can go back to Psalm chapter 23, and here's what David said. He said, oh, God, your shepherd, rather your staff, and your rod, what did they do? They comfort me. Does that mean Jesus, like, you know, beating David with a rod? Like, bam! Thank you. <laughs> One more, please. No, the rod and the staff were used to protect the sheep from the things that were around. So the Bible is saying, hey, the rod is there to protect and to fight things off and, and to work things. That doesn't mean we don't discipline our kids. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, don't, please don't use this verse as an excuse to beat the crap out of your kids and say, well, the Bible said it. That's just not true. But again, spanking, I'm not going to deal with that. You can work through that theologically how you want to, but... Just don't use this for to say why. Is that fair? 